it has been averred by too many people too many times that all bodybuilders are dumb. A dumb person is one who doesn't know the truth but slaps them in the face. The response to my tape proved that not all bodybuilders are dumb. In fact, they are far from it. Right. As clear as I was on that tape, it takes a at least a fairly well-developed mind to follow the long trains of reasoning that I used. Many who responded couldn't clearly verbalize what it was they liked, but I, I realized in an analyzing later on that what they were what they were responding to were in fact their own values. Aristotle defined a friend as that other person, that one in whom we see ourselves. Those who responded positively to that take value knowledge, science, reason, the mind and human progress. Right. Well, that makes that makes sense. The you had some extraordinary cases of, uh, you know, like, like uh, excitement. I mean, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I just talked to a guy this morning who claimed that since he first received that tape several months ago, he's listened to it at least 15 to 20 times, and that is not a uh, an unusual statement. I've had, I didn't keep an accurate count here, of course, but I've had so many people call me and tell me that they've listened to the tape at least a dozen times that I, I'm actually quite shocked. I, I've been joking about it now. I say, yeah, listening to Mike Mentzer is better than listening to Michael Jackson. Right. Some people had uh, experienced fairly intense emotions and even grew almost lyrically mystical about it, uh, claiming they became addicted to listening, actually addicted to, to it, doing so at home in their uh, in the gym with their training partners and in their cars on the way to work. Okay. What they liked actually was the meticulous use of logic and the broad philosophical scientific context in which they heard bodybuilding, their great passion discussed. And the crystal clear understanding of course which this helped them to achieve. Right. Now, I, I I think that there's something going on and then like I said that's why, you know, we're gonna go back and we're gonna ask the go over some of the points that we talked about in the first tape in this interview and we're going to you know take it a step further uh -huh. but it, it is fascinating and i will admit that i didn't expect people to become you know that outrageously enthusiastic well, about another trans sensation of sorts that uh i was just dreaming the other day that it would be great if 200,000 bodybuilders could hear that tape it would cause a dramatic revolution in the sport yeah, I agree with that, Mike. Many more people need to, you know, get this information, but that's what we're trying to do with the tapes. And I'll tell uh, our listeners, who are also Muscle Media 2000 subscribers, that there's an article uh, about you that's pretty interesting in the next issue of Muscle Media 2000, and we hope to get your input on a regular basis so that we can share this message with more people about how to really train uh, for size and strength gains. Can you tell me a little bit about where you think some of the ill-conceived ideas uh, that are so you know prevalent in, in in weight training today came from yeah uh, as a matter of fact this is an issue i've given some considerable thought to recently quite a few of the people who call me bill are still reluctant to fully let go of what they used to believe about bodybuilding they're having a little bit of a hard time fully accepting what they heard on the first tape despite its clarity and and logic, I tell those people that in order to be able to successfully discard from their subconscious all those ideas that are hampering them and clashing with these new ideas they heard on the tape, it might it might be beneficial if I pointed out to them where those ideas came from, the old ideas. Right. In fact, the basic premises which shape the thought and determine the actions of the vast majority of bodybuilders today, Bill, originated in the early part of this century with the man who was responsible for starting the weightlifting bodybuilding movement in this country, Bob Huffman. Uh, in the 1920s, Bob Huffman decided that he would manufacture and sell barbells. Of course, along with the barbells, he had to provide a training manual. 
having but a merit of middling education with little or nothing in the areas of science, philosophy, or logic, Bob Huffman, like everybody else for whom that is true, was victim to the power of tradition. Something I learned reading Ayn Rand in philosophy recently is that the role of chance, accident, and tradition in a person's life stands in inverse ratio to the power of that individual's philosophical equipment. For those of you who really love the philosophy, and there were a lot of those, by the way. Mm -hmm. Bob Hoffman was an old-fashioned, traditional kind of a guy. In our culture, the number three has a certain traditional magic. For instance, there's three square meals a day. There's three sides to a triangle. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Things like that. Traditional ideas. In formulating a training methodology, Bob Hoffman said everybody trained three times a week. Why not? It uh, seems to be a, a number that works so well in so many other areas. The point here is that tradition, I'm sorry, science has nothing to do with the arbitrary, including tradition. Many of our traditional beliefs are actually arbitrary or based on convenience. I tell those people who have a hard time working with some of these new ideas, look where these ideas came from. Where did Bob Hoffman get the idea of three? Because we eat three square meals a day, and there's a father, son, a holy ghost, there's three, there's pyramid power. Some, some people actually believe there's a special magic with a pyramid or a triangle. Mm -hmm. That's mystical. It has nothing to do with science. Why didn't Bob Huffman suggest everyone train three times a month, in fact? Another good point. Because 99% of the people in this country and all over the world plan their lives short range in terms of a week. Many of the people that I've talked to on the phone who have heard this and came to understand it found it easier to discard some of that old stuff. They took my advice the advice I gave on the first date. They discarded what they thought they knew. They're taking a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing. They're willing to experiment, uh, work with these new ideas, and are, in fact, training only two to three times each month for each body part. And in almost every single case, they're reporting at least satisfactory progress, and in some cases, dramatic, and in other cases, even phenomenal progress. So that would be every body part, like once every 10 days? Yeah, or even less frequently. Wow. You see, the, the point that I made on the first tape is perhaps one I, I should emphasize again here. More is not really better. That really should be thoroughly just pretend you never even heard that idea. Take a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing. Why shouldn't you train necessarily two or three times? I'm not saying that is definitely the best way to do it, but if you understand where those other beliefs came from and you understand the necessity of taking a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing, why not give serious consideration to the idea of training each body part only two or three times a month? Hmm. Why not? No, no logical reason. There's no reason. I'm emphasizing all of this only because of the the reluctance, again, of some people to, to embrace these new ideas or to, to give them any serious consideration at all. Right. <laughs> well, I think that something that, I mean, that is the big thing. A lot of people are, are saying, well, Mike is, is probably right in a way, but I'm probably right in a way. Also. Right in a way. Hold on a second. Uh -huh. I don't grant anybody the premise that there's somebody else out there who has given this thing more serious consideration than I have. If he's out there, Billy's hiding. I'm not saying I've got the ultimate or final answer, but I have no doubt I'm going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. If you can come up with one single individual who, who can point out a contradiction in my logic, I'll give you $1,000 because I'd like to learn, too. I'm not saying that I'm omniscient or it's fallible. Again, I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I'm sure about, I'm certain about what I'm certain about. Right. It not only is true in theory, this stuff works in practice. Yeah. A lot of people are still continuing to say it only works for Mike Mincer and Casey Viator and perhaps now Dorian Yates. That is not true, but if it did, did work even just for one person, don't you think, dear listener, it would be at least worth trying? Mm -hmm. if, if for no other reason, then you could save all that time in the gym. Right. 
to go a little bit further, by the way, with this idea of traditional beliefs and where most bodybuilders, where most bodybuilders get their their ideas, the ideas that shape their thinking and guide their actions in the gym. Not too long after Bob Hoffman was on the scene, perhaps 15 to 20 years, a guy named Joe Weider came along. Joe Weider didn't like the fact that this old-fashioned buddy-duddy, Bob Huffman over there in York, Pennsylvania, had such a stranglehold on the market. Joe Weider wanted to wrest some of the market away from him. He said, I'm progressive. I'm a progressive individual. Don't train three times a week. More is better. Train six days a week. But he wasn't that progressive because he still suggested everybody take Sunday off for Sabbath. Crazy. Very scientific. <laughs> So this is just fueling, I mean, is this, I mean, now people are doing, uh, you know, everyday training and sometimes two times a day training. I mean, is it, despite what you've been trying to get across, people are just continuing to train more and more from where I stand. Well, there, there is that particular element. There are those bodybuilders who apparently never came to identify the the role or nature or value of logic, reason, science in their lives, and I mean that literally. There are those individuals for whom you can paint a picture so clear a blind man or idiot could understand it, but it has no impact in their consciousness. Mm -hmm. Their actions are guided primarily by what they see others doing, and we talked about this on the first tape. Right. Most people are, in fact, intellectually dependent, and a lot of bodybuilders are. I've made this, this argument very clearly in all of my articles, all of my books and seminars all over the world. And apparently most people just, a lot of people, just don't understand the power, the crucial importance of a logical argument. Again, they do what they do based on what they see other people doing. Well, how can Mike Mentzer be right? Why should he be so certain when in fact everybody else seems to be doing it quite differently? Just the other day in Gold's Gym, a man said that to me. Why are you so darn certain? And I said, well, aren't you certain that two and two is four? Why are you pissed off that I'm certain about this? Why can't I be? If you're certain that two and two is four, I can be certain about this, and I am certain. If you would take the time and listen to the logic of my argument and find one contradiction, I'll throw the whole damn thing out. Mm -hmm. This stuff is literally true. If, if NASA, the Space Administration, can send a man to the moon and bring him back successfully each time, then why can't we succeed with each one of our missions to the gym? Why can't we build muscles here on Earth? Right. There is a science of exercise, people. There really is. I, I said that on the last tape, and I've been telling a lot of people since, and I, I see now quite clearly, Bill, that a lot of this has to do with a failure of people to integrate their knowledge. We all know that NASA exists. We all know that there's a science of medicine and a, a science of astronomy, a science of physics and mathematics. In mathematics, two and two is four. I don't care how big the arm of the guy is who asserts it's five, it's still four. Mm -hmm. There is a scientific approach to exercise too, people. There really is. I know you've been reading those muscle magazines and becoming mesmerized by the pictures of all those great bodybuilders, and as a result, you're forgetting to use the knowledge you gained in grammar school, high school, college. Mm -hmm. There is a science of medicine. The science of exercise, like I said on the first tape, like the science of medicine, is based on principles of human physiology. They apply to everybody. What about the group of people? And this is what I've discovered, is that they're saying, well, I've been doing 15 sets, and Mike says to do one. So I think that I would be ahead if I cut down to five or six. I mean, is that is that any benefit to these people? Well, they're, they're, they're better off if for no other reason than they're not so severely overtrained and possibly damaging their body. And they're saving some time. But they're missing one crucial point here. We're not just looking to do less or to do what feels just about right. What we're looking for here, Bill and listener, is the precise amount of exercise required. As I said on the first tape, too, 
Mm -hmm. Science is an exact, an exacting discipline. A proper science of bodybuilding, therefore, should tell the individual exactly how many sets to do. The muscle magazines continue to advocate that everybody do 12 to 20. That's not very exact. Is it 12 or is it 20? It's not exact at all, and therefore it's not scientific. Science, as I said a moment ago, is an exact, an exacting discipline. Imagine we're down there with my favorite people, Nassau, at Houston headquarters control Nassau before, before a manned moon launch. And the director yells down to the end of the control module, Hey, Fred, why don't you try throwing a blue switch this time instead of a red one? Let's see what happens. You think you'd ever get to the moon? <laughs> see my point when I say science is an exact discipline? Perhaps a better analogy here is this. Bill, if you were going to go into surgery tomorrow, you would very much want your anesthesiologist to give you the precise amount of anesthesia necessary. Any more than that, you, you would grow toxic and possibly die. The point is this. The human being is a specific entity with specific characteristics and specific requirements. The key concept there is specific. I call my approach to bodybuilding, Bill, a rational approach. The basis of a rational approach to bodybuilding, or any other arena of human endeavor actually, is the recognition that only the specific appropriate knowledge can lead one to engage in the purposeful action required to successfully achieve a goal. I came to understand recently, during a period of more serious thought on this, that in fact the concept of specificity is the most important concept in science. The concept of specificity shapes and underlies the phenomena of rationality itself. 